Well, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you all again this Wednesday night. Uh, as you can see from the, the title of the message, it's about uh, Cain and Abel. And uh, I started on this actually a couple of weeks ago um, through uh, looking into the word before about um, free election of grace and uh, the upcoming uh, addition to my family that uh, is going to be happening soon, which has happened now. Um, and just all the different things that were kind of transpiring in my life brought me to this to this uh, early passage in the, in the Word, in Genesis 4, about Cain and Abel. So if you join me there, Genesis 4, 1 through 13, verse 1 through 13. <clears throat> and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. It said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Oh, I'll wait for a second to get there. Everybody there? Okay. <clears throat> and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. He had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt not thou be accepted? Or shalt thou not be accepted? Excuse me. And if thou not do, doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou or cursed from the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. So, after reading this, um, I thought, beforehand, I thought I knew the story of Adam and Eve pretty well. Um, and this kind of opened up a little bit more perspective to what happened at the fall, the original fall. Um, so I went back and I started looking and um, kind of tried to piece it together from the very beginning. And uh, I saw in Genesis 3, uh, verse 23 through 24, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it for you. After sinning in the garden, Adam and Eve's lives seemed pretty bad, seemed pretty bleak, like there really wasn't any hope for them. So in Genesis 23, 24, therefore the Lord God sent him forth, sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. This is Adam. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So here Adam and Eve they sinned and they were cast out from the garden. God placed an angel or a cherubim to keep Adam and Eve out of the garden, the place that, the only place they knew, their home, up to that point. And uh, they couldn't eat from their only source of food up to that point, the tree of life. They were driven out and forced to work the ground, to sweat, to toil. And instead of just sitting around and enjoying life and uh, speaking with God and, and eating things that they didn't have to work for, they had to uh, had to endure pain, sorrow, and toil, and eventually was the end. It was death, and uh, they probably thought, "Ooh, this isn't looking so good." And suddenly, God gives them new mercy in their lives, the prospect of a child. And uh, of how many people here have experienced this, but. When you hear first that you're going to have another baby, you're going to have another child, it's just this feeling of 
just, I guess, hope, um, love for another child, another, your, your whole family changes and usually changes in a way you're not very comfortable with at first, but then eventually you realize that it's for the best. So in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4, Adam knew his wife and she conceived. So this was the, the wonder of new life and new beginning. It's a promise of a better tomorrow for them. Then this new life begins with Cain and Abel. <clears throat> she has another baby right after. Um, so up to this point, I can only imagine how Adam felt when his wife was pregnant. Uh, just the, the anticipation and expecting a new new baby and feeling the baby kick against the side of her belly, listening to the heartbeat, um, thinking about all the things that you need to get ready, and all the all the wonderful things that you're going to experience with the new baby. And then Eve gives birth to the newest or the first baby in this world. She's the first person to experience childbirth. She probably didn't know any of it, what any of it was going to be like. Um, she's the first person to enjoy holding a newborn baby in her arms for the first time and seeing that that look between the mother and the child um, Adam gets to see that for the first time too um, I just got to experience that myself and it's a it's a very touching experience so then um, in this verse they kind of span time pretty quickly and said can enable then grow up I haven't quite experienced that myself but some of you have um, I know that my kids, when they're before me, I teach them the same thing. So these Cain and Abel, they had the same home, the same parents, received the same instruction, and uh, heard the same word of God. They saw the same things, same experiences. and they. But as they grew up, they started to kind of diverge, started to go different ways because of their origin. So they choose jobs. Um, verse 2 it says that Cain became becomes a farmer or a tiller of the ground, and Abel becomes a shepherd or a keeper of the sheep. And uh, as their parents probably taught them, uh, they came before God to give him an offering, verse 3 through 5. And this is where the real difference really starts to come out between them. Uh, it's pretty stark right off the bat. It says in verse 4, the Lord had respect to Abel and his offering. Respect means to look upon something with approval and to accept it. In verse 5, it said, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Abel brought the, the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. So it's a pretty pretty stark difference in what they what they brought. Uh, Abel brought something that he was given, brought something he didn't work for. And Cain brought exactly the opposite. Something from the ground, something he worked his hands for, and uh, something he would soon realize was unacceptable to God. So <clears throat> I kind of Look through, the, look through the word a little bit more, and I found in Proverbs 16, verse 25, if you turn with me there. Cain did something that I think all of us have done once or twice in our lives. Uh, and if you're brought to know the Lord savingly, something you've been taught that isn't the right way, the right thing to do. And Cain was rejected because he did what seemed right to him. In Proverbs 16, verse 25, says, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. This right here describes Cain's life perfectly. Describes the lives of all those that walk after flesh perfectly. This lifestyle, this is the lifestyle that the Bible calls the way of Cain. So in Jude 11, you don't have to turn there, I can just read it to you. It says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. So this was all this all happened with the first family. 
first two children to ever be born on the earth. Uh, and just like Jacob and Esau later on, didn't have anything to do with what they were taught. Didn't have anything to do with who their parents were. Didn't have anything to do with what they saw or what they experienced. It had everything to do with an acceptable offering and an unacceptable offering. So then later on I saw Abel. He didn't live very long, uh, but his story spoke volumes. Abel knew that bloodshed atonement was the only covering for sin. The only one could ever be accepted. And he knew this because it was what he was taught by his parents. It's taught by the Word. Genesis 3.21, you don't have to turn there, I can just read it to you. said, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. To make these coats of skins, there had to be bloodshed. There had to be an animal that was sacrificed, that was killed. And uh, it was that covering, that covering of blood that atoned for their sin. Made it so they didn't have to die. So, um, I, I looked a little bit further into uh, the offering of the fruit of the field. <clears throat> and it said both in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, God commanded Israel to offer of the fruit of the field, to thank him for his blessings that he had given them, to acknowledge him as a, the sole resource for all their provisions. But the food offerings that were commanded by God didn't have anything to do with atonement for sin. It was that blood sacrifice was the only acceptable way. And the ultimate sacrifice was yet to be made when Christ Jesus came into the world and, be, and was given, and he gave his life for the sinners on the cross. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 19, if you turn with me there, this is pretty telling of this and sums it up pretty well. <clears throat> Verse 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by, by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, so the things like silver and gold that come from the ground that were toiled about, about by men weren't acceptable. But it's just the precious blood of Christ, just as the lamb that was slain when Abel gave it as an offering, is the only thing, the only blood atonement for sin. So Abel also knew that there was only one way for man to come to God. And this is from Genesis all the way through Revelation. God's method for cleansing sin has always remained the same. It takes the blood of an innocent sacrifice to cleanse the sinner of his sins. So in Hebrews 9.22, I can read that one for you. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Pretty simple. On the one hand, there's remission of sin. On the other, there isn't. On the one hand... An acceptable offering, Christ's blood. On the other hand, man's work, unacceptable, completely. So, um, <clears throat> it uh, from Genesis uh, uh, all the way through through Revelation. Uh, in Genesis, it was in the garden, the coats of skins that God ca God gave to Adam and Eve to cover for their sins, and uh, later on in Exodus. <laughs> In Egypt, during the Passover, when the blood of the lamb was put across the lentil of their of their door to keep the the death angel out, and then in Leviticus, when in Egypt, when the high priest on the day of atonement entered into the holy place with the blood sacrifice, and on and on, all the way to uh, the at Calvary. When the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was judged in the place of sinners, the place of all of his elect for their sins. So this is in 2 Corinthians and 1 Peter. And you guys can check that out if you'd like. Uh, but it's a common theme all the way through. Um, and it's 
It's unwavering. It's uh, ironclad. Word of God. <clears throat> so um, another thing that I was looking into was some may think that the, the offering of Cain really wasn't that bad. Or maybe, you know, at least he gave something. Or something like that. At least he worked toward it. Um, I've heard, I'm sure you've heard that from other people, from other churches. Uh, I do, or I don't do this, or I do that. And that's why I was saved. I heard one guy tell me he was, he was, he knew he was saved when he was, I think, 12 years old. And he remembers it was on Flag Day. And uh, he, he gave his, uh, his okay to be saved. He asked Jesus into his heart. That's what it was. Excuse me. So I started to look into um, the different verses on what would characterize a person like Cain. Um, well, first thing I saw was that Cain's actions were characterized by an unbelieving heart. And that heart that is believing is given by the Lord or by God the Father and uh, saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Hebrews 11:4, it shows these, these things where it uh, explained a little bit more into the, the, the two positions of Cain and Abel back in Genesis. So in Hebrews 11:4, if you turn with me there, I have to read that one for you. <clears throat> by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God, testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaketh. So in here, Cain believed there was another way and perished because of his unbelief, while Abel followed God's way and provided an excellent sacrifice. So then in 1 John 3, 12, you don't have to turn there and just read it for you. Not as Cain, who was that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So this again, the, the two sides. Cain was wicked because of his own because his own works were evil. And Abel, he wasn't. He was righteous because he relied on the works of another. And in Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23, it says, uh, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not proph prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This is also the ways of Cain. Cain revealed his lost condition through an unbelieving heart and rejected the gospel of grace. And in, his, in its place, he put his own works of iniquity. So then later on, um, still characterizing Cain, so he was characterized, his actions were characterized by an unrepentant heart. Verse 5 through 7, God said that his countenance fell. His whole demeanor changed. He didn't even want to talk with God. Um, he didn't understand why God wouldn't accept his offering and accepted Abel's instead. And God speaks to Cain and asks him why he's upset in verses 6 through 7. And instead of falling before God, worshiping him, saying you're right, he gets angry with God. And uh, he gets wroth. It means to burn with hot anger or jealousy. And God tells Cain in verse 7 that if he did what was right and he brought an acceptable sacrifice, he would be accepted too. But if he doesn't, then sin lieth at the door. And uh, also Cain's actions were characterized by an ungodly heart. Verses 8 through 10, what did he do to try to cover it up? 
to try to get away with what um, with with what he did and try to eliminate the acceptable one. He went after his brother and killed him. And when God uh, comes to ask him, where is he? He lies. And he says he doesn't know. And then he asks God, is he his brother's keeper? Kind of uh, throwing it back in God's face. And then God tells Cain that he knows what he's done. I mean, how couldn't he? He's God. And that Abel's blood cries to him from the ground. Abel's, the, the blood that was shed by Cain, um, wrongly, cries from the ground. So, in all of this, uh, kind of did a little bit of introspection, or there's a little bit of use to it for you. Um, if you look, if you look to what your life says about you, what is the condition of your heart? Is it walking after the course of the world, or is it walking after Christ? So in Ephesians two and verses one through three. If you turn with me there, there's a a word for you. <clears throat> and you hath he quickened who were dead in tras trespasses and sins, wherein, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of the world of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others? Or is it in the need of, of a physician? In Mark, two, in Mark chapter 2 and verse 17, I can read that one for you. Uh, it says, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If it is, an, if it is walking in according, according to the course of this world, or in need of a physician, then uh, the things to do is to cry for God's mercy, to give understanding that it's not about what seems right to you, as Cain thought. And call, cry for God's mercy to know that God's will is what is to be done. To do like Abel did, provide the acceptable sacrifice, and rely on the acceptable sacrifice. Cry for God's mercy to be given to know that the blood of Christ is the only offering for sin atonement. And cry for God's mercy to be made whole by the physician Christ, as it says in Mark 2. And cry for God's grace to be caused to repent and be given a new heart to believe.